And Jesus Christ was the one who arose up and went and took the book out of the right hand of him to sit upon the throne and open the book and begin to decode the message. And he gave that message to twelve men. And those twelve men got the message. And that message was what caused uh, them to produce uh, uh, a man-child that was caught up to God and this throne. I know a lot of people don't believe that, but that's, that's the truth anyway. There, there was an early rain gathering. There was an early rain reaping. His fan was in his hand. He truly purged his floor. He gathered the wheat into the garner. Remember, Israel had wheat, and there was a great stack of wheat, and, and, and the chaff was burned up with unquenchable fire. Well, what was the wheat? That was a people that accepted the full gospel of Jesus Christ, and the rest rejected it. From the, uh, even the baptism uh, that John preached, they rejected that. And uh, the rest, of course, went into the fire of God's wrath in A.D. 70. Now we've come to the close this day. What are we doing right now to prepare ourselves for this onslaught that's coming? I think if we would consider what, what's coming, how are we going to deal? And then this is serious. You know, you know, something like this don't cause people to shout. I can sing a song right now, and if you give me a guitar, I, I don't want it, but you give me a guitar right now, one of them electric guitars, and I can start singing a song, Oh, you old dry bones, share the word of the Lord, and I can have this congregation shouting. But brother, this don't make a shout. But brother, this is something serious. This is something real serious. We're going to have to face this. After you do everything else, you're going to have to come back to the Word of God. That's the finality. That's the saturation part. We're going to have to come back to that. And it's wonderful that we're, there's men among us that are serious about this thing. What are we going to do with thousands of people? This is my vision. That's going to come in. And they're coming in. How, how are we going to handle them? I'm not talking about just people's going to come out of Babylon. Revelations 18, 4, come out of her, my people. There's going to be a great crowd that's going to come out of Babylon. And they're going to need special training. They're, they're, they're go you're going to have to deal with their minds. Not get them to just be shouting and, and praying for them because they've had all that. They've had all that. They, they, they shout, they speak in tongues, they get healed and all that. They've had all that. But brother, you've got to deal with their minds. They're going to have to deal with their minds to make them one. They're going to have to deal with their minds to make them one. One faith, one faith, one faith. God taught Jesus, Jesus taught the apostles the same identical thing. And the apostles taught the church, and Jesus said to them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and teaching them to observe, practice, do and keep whatsoever I have commanded you. Brother, that's strict, that's meticulous. Lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end. And they did that, and they accomplished it and judged the people. And they sat on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And there may have been a duality to that interpretation, but brother, the twelve apostles judged Israel. The twelve apostles ju judged Israel, and they judged them by the word of God. And in these closing days, God must have a ministry. And listen, we're not going to come back. When, God, when the zero hour is set, our leader Jesus Christ looks at his watch, figuratively speaking, and he says, go forward, whether we're not going to come back and get some more gear. We're going to have on the whole armor of God, and we're going to have the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. And what we say, we're not going to have to rub it out. We're not going to have to come back and tell the saints to do it over again, because, brother, what we do is going to be right. Amen, amen, amen. And don't you think... There'll be people from these taverns. Don't you think there'll be people from the brothels, the red light districts, and the poor people uh, from various sections of our cities coming into this? Don't you think God will give them a chance? The poor receive the gospel gladly. The drunkards and harlots would go in the kingdom before you. They'll be coming in. Can't, can't you feel that? 
Can't you feel? Who's going to take care of them? They're going to be coming in just by the thousands and by the thousands. How are we going to do? Are we going to use the same methods we used before? I've got some thoughts I'd like to introduce to you. And we just might as well get acquainted with them now because it's the Word of God. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't mean to be a Bible expositor or a smart aleck. But brother, I've tried to study this unbiasedly, and if it's for any purpose, it's to share with my good brethren. But surely you don't believe this is, this is what we're going to have. Little mission halls and little churches where 40 or 50 or 60 people is, and once in a great while somebody comes in, and a bunch of people gathers around them and prays them through the Holy Ghost. Fifteen or twenty people hollering in their ears and screaming, and shaking them and massaging them and trying to get them through the Holy Ghost. You don't, you don't really believe that's going to happen, do you? Can't you see them coming in by the thousands? Hmm? <clears throat> I think we've made it pretty hard on people. Really. But let's go back to the Bible on this to start out with for just a few moments. You need to have your Bible. You can turn to it. I could quote the Bible. But we'll return to Matthew Of course, this, this is talking about John the Baptist. Verse 11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water. Unto repentance. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Water unto repentance. Then Mark 1 and 4, the baptism of repentance. It's called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It's the baptism of repentance. Now, that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? It says I don't. It's a conjoined condition. When you repent, you've got to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. It's the baptism of repentance. Baptism of repentance. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent, and be baptized every one of you, what for? For the remission of your sins. And I'd like for anybody to find me any place in the Bible. Now, we're dealing with the Bible. We're not dealing with, with, with something they brought out of the Catholic Church or Protestant churches or Pentecostal churches. You show me any place in the Bible where they brought somebody to a wooden bench and had them get down there and pray and pray and pray. And finally, after maybe two or three days, they got converted. And then when Easter come, they baptized them in water. Or when they got enough to make a shown in the church, they baptized them in water. You can't find that, brother. Because your, your repentance is not complete until you're baptized in water. It's the baptism of repentance. And 
And it is necessary if you're penting it, if you're penting it, it isn't necessary for you to come to a wooden bench and tell the Lord how mean you was. If you're penting it, you're ready. Everything's all right. Huh? What I'm getting at is this. If there was a thousand people in here today, a thousand, and, and they're, they're, they, heard the, they heard the message on water baptism and repentance, they could march up here and be baptized in water, and that's all would be necessary. Oh, some of us may make them to get down at the altar somewhere, get down at a wooden bench somewhere and say, you've got to repent, you've got to repent. Well, it's a baptism of repentance. That bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. They obeyed God in the in the uh, in the order of uh, repentance. In other words, they have repented. I'm going to give you several other scriptures. In the uh, eighth chapter of the book of uh, Acts. When Philip had that successful meeting down at Samaria, and he was on his way to, to another section of the country, he met a man coming from Jerusalem who had been up there worshiping God, and the Spirit told him to join himself to that chariot. And he was reading Isaiah, and uh, he asked him, do you understand what you read? And he said, how can I accept some man showing me from that scripture? He began to preach Christ to him. And uh, this man got under conviction. He was pricked in his heart. He already repented in his heart. You don't have to go you don't have to go through a big rigmarole to repent. Do you think you do? All you got to do is just change your mind and be sorry for your sins. And this man said, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? And he said, if thou believest, thou mayest. And this eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And right there he made his confession of faith and that proved conclusively that was fruit meat for repentance. And they went down into the water and he baptized him. Right there, that was a baptism of repentance. Wasn't it? Another scripture is found in uh, the uh, tenth chapter. Of course, it's a little off the beat, but I'll, I'll get the other one. The sixteenth chapter of of uh, Acts, and it's beginning the twenty fifth verse. I won't uh, read all that, but Paul. But Paul I was put in prison, he and Silas, and um, of course there was a great earthquake and uh, the jail was just about ready to shake down and the jailer thought that all of the prisoners had escaped and he was about ready to kill himself. And uh, Paul said, do yourself no harm, we're all here. And the jailer fell down and said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, this jailer and his house made a, made a confession of faith. And that night, way in the middle of the night, they went out and were baptized in water. Okay. Brother, them people believe in getting baptized right away. Hmm? They believe in getting baptized right away. Because it's, it's, part, of, it's part of your repentance. Brother, if, if, when thousands of people start coming in, do you think you're going to deal individually with people? It's going to be mass production. It's going to be mass production. There'll be thousands of people who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may be 15 or 20 elders in, in the great mass there begin to baptize them in water. That's right. And they, they, they'll be converted. 
because it's the baptism of repentance. There's no place in the Bible uh, where... Oh, you say, I know a lot of people got... I know you do. I know you do. That's the way I got it. That's the way I got it. People got around to me, and some people said I had to, I had to pay back uh, money that I'd borrowed and, and all these different things. Well, God knew everything about me. Our brother, repentance is just like that. With the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confessions made into salvation. Naturally, with, when you get salvation, you want to tell about it. And then the next step is water baptism right away, as quick as, you, as quick as you can, because it's conjoined. It's the baptism of repentance. I love that, don't you? I don't know about you. you I know the oneness people used to do that, but they wasn't wrong on everything. No. Had a whole lot of things right. We've got a pool at our church, and I filled it with water the other night. I don't think I'm radical. I may be kind of radical on the word. I'm trying to hold to it. But we're trying to restore some things. What we're trying to do, just like the Bible said. And I said, leave the water in there. Leave it in there. And when it gets kind of soiled, that I think it's soiled, we'll just empty it out and pour some more in. And anybody that gets converted in our church right that night, we're going to baptize them in water. We're going to baptize them in water right that night as quick as we can. There's a fellow said, well, you, you wait a while, brother. We want to get 15 or 20 together before we baptize, maybe a month. There, there's no Bible for anything like that. Quick as you can. Hallelujah. You repent of your sins to be baptized in water, and, and, and that, 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 completes, your, that uh, completes your repentance and, and remission of sins, doesn't it? Well, you say, water, do, well, wait a minute. Peter said, we're unto baptism that also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of flesh, but it's an answer of a good conscience towards God. If God commands it, then the blood of Jesus Christ. The efficacy, the efficacy isn't in the water, but it's in the commandment. And that's sprinkled on that commandment, and the efficacy is on the commandment. And Peter said, we're, he uses the flood. Weren't too bad, to, and, and that that flood did save them from that ungodly world, didn't it? And he said, "Weren't too baptism is also now save us, not to putting away the filth of flesh, but an answer of a good conscience towards God." It saves us. It saves us. Did, didn't didn't uh, Mark say, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved." Somebody wrote in one time and asked me a question and said, Well, Brother Souders, what about all these millions of people that's not baptized? I said, That's not my job. My job is to say they shall be damned, that's all. But my job isn't to damn them. Hey, Amen, brother, that's the truth. Somebody said, We're lawyers. All we do is produce the law, and then the judge, the judge passes sentence. That's all. The Bible says that. Oh, say, I know they're good people. They do. I don't care how good they are. In the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, the Pharisees and Sadducees rejected the counsel of God, not being baptized by John. They rejected the counsel of God. It was God's counsel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be what? That's all I said. That's all I tell the people. So there's, there's a number of scriptures in there that proves that. Well, won't that be wonderful, really? Here comes thousands of people in. Thousands of people. Thousands of people. Uh, you, you preach on repentance. Preach Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He died for you and I. Poured out His blood. Sprinkled it upon the commandments of baptism. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Maybe a thousand people will scream out, give their heart to God. The, the, the big pool opens up. Fifteen or twenty elders rush up there. Here they come in a big stream, one right after the other. Plunk, 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 plunk. <laughs> Hallelujah! You ever, you ever go in a great big Ford plane on assembly line? 
See one feller fixing something on a car? Here, the car goes down. Here's another feller fixing something. Here's another feller fixing something. Here's another feller fixing something. Another fixing something. First thing you know, end of the line, everything's all fine. It's supposed to be all fine. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the way it's going to be. 3,000 got the Holy Ghost. Right. On the day of Pentecost, think of that. You mean to tell me they got a bunch of people around them, people and praying for them to get converted? No. Why, it's silly. That's silly. God touched their heart and they repented. That's right. Repented, yes, indeed. Hallelujah. It's going to be easy, brother. It's going to be easy. Well, there's a whole lot to that. Let me read this. Restoration is not something that is handed down by tradition. It must be discovered anew by every generation. But if you fail, if a generation fails to discover restoration, it's a kebab over the door for it. It becomes a formal church system. I believe with all my heart that this is this is just a this is a little phase of restoration that we all need in our churches. This isn't something radical, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. Well you say, brother, maybe they all won't repent. Well you're supposed to have the you're supposed to have feeling. I know there's some people some people it, it's like having a baby, a woman having a baby. All women does not have a baby naturally. Some women, they have to have a cesarean operation. Others have the baby on their way to the hospital without the assistance of anybody. But we want to get away from that cesarean stuff. Don't we? Thank God. Five hundred received the Holy Ghost last night. Woo! Thousand were baptized in water. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's what it's coming to, brother. Don't you see it then? Who are all these people? Every nation, tongue, kindred, and people coming up out of great tribulation. Worse their robes made them white in the blood of the Lamb. God's going to have a church that's going to know all the technicalities, how to get people through to the Lord quickly. Yes, indeed, not go through all of this maneuverism, maneuverability. Think on this. Think on this. Don't challenge me right now. Or are you going to challenge me with you don't have any scriptures? I might refer to one, uh, uh, Peter, 10th chapter of the book of Acts, uh, while he was speaking the word, the Holy Ghost fell on and heard the word, and of course, uh, he said, Now can any man forbid water, that they should be baptized, seeing they received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Somebody might be able to say, Well, their sins weren't forgiven yet. But wait a minute. Most people had repented. God knew that. Those people had actually repented. God knew it. And water baptism is uh, an act by a, a human being and by natural element of water. Yet it's a commandment of God. And so that was a quickie. That isn't, that isn't the routine. That's a quickie. And God made provision for that. And in the 19th chapter, I better take that up. In the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul met certain disciples, said to them, You see the Holy Ghost and you believe. They said, We don't know whether there be a Holy Ghost. He said, To whom are you baptized? They said, To John's baptism. That John verily baptized the baptism of repentance, saying to people, That you should believe on him that should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, they were baptized over. The reason why this baptized over because every indication every indication proves that Apollos baptized him. 
Apollos was from Alexandria. He was an eloquent orator, fervent in the spirit, mighty in the, in the scriptures, came to Ephesus preaching, only knowing the baptism of John. This is after the day of Pentecost. And say, remember this, after the day of Pentecost, no one has the authority to baptize or function in the church that doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You shouldn't have nobody in your church operating or working in your church that doesn't have the Holy Ghost. We believe that, don't we? Yes, sir. All right. Got a lot of people through with water baptism, didn't we? Thousands of them got through the water baptism. Now, you all study that. This is, just, this is just like that man talking about vitamins. Some of you don't believe it. I couldn't understand that man. He said some words that I didn't under, I couldn't understand. In fact, I couldn't spell them. And because I couldn't spell them, I couldn't go to my dictionary and, and understand what they meant. But, I, but, but you can go to the Bible and understand what I'm talking about. Sounds reasonable, don't know what I was talking about. Of course I'm going to justify myself, I believe it. Number two. Now really, I, I'm not condemning you because we're in the restoration. And brother, listen. If the last dispensation, what, everything in it was right, then we've got no reason to get out of that dispensation. Let's stay in it. But because everything in it wasn't right, we're in a new dispensation, and that new dispensation is to correct the things that was wrong in the old dispensation. Now, number two. I've studied quite a bit on how to do things right. I don't do everything right, possibly, but I've studied on how to do things right. And I've watched people... Um, being interrogated at the altar. Now you all bear with me and don't think I'm mean. I'm trying to get the Holy Ghost. And it's one it's one of the most saddest pictures I've ever seen in a church. It's a God's truth. I don't know whether you believe it or not. You say they get it, but oh how they get it. Now, I've seen people come up to the altar. Now, they may not do it in your church, but probably I've never been in your church. But I've been in a lot of churches. And they may be a, a dozen people or half a dozen people gather around them. And one person will be hollering in, in, in the right ear, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Someone hollering in the left ear, Say glory, glory, say glory, glory. Somebody else saying, raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. And somebody else massaging them in the breast. I know it's laughable, it is really laughable. Of course, I've seen people get the Holy Ghost that way of all. How in the world did they get it? Just the mercy of God is all I know. In spite of it, they got it. And I know people don't mean it. But there's a, now, since I've went this far, I might as well go all the rest of the way. <laughs> and there's so many people don't realize it. I'm going to get in trouble with people. But there's so many people don't realize it. That they don't, they don't, they don't uh, especially in a meeting, you don't have a chance to brush your teeth.
And you know as well as I do, there's nothing much more offensive than unclean dentures. They smell terrible. That's the truth. That's absolutely true. I say, how do you know? Because I smell them. And see, I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just telling you the truth about it. And you take four or five people getting around somebody with all, all with upper and lower dentures. Brother, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you, 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 you talk about, you talk about uh, going out there and breathing that foul air. That ain't nothing to it. <laughs> and then not only that, and I know people don't realize it. I really, they mean well precious people and then they turn on a spew system <laughs> you know what a spew system is just spew a person's face and ears with with, <laughs> with particles of spit <laughs> still meaning well too mean well very well Brother, you and my friends, I may not get out of here alive. <laughs> but it's the truth, folks. And people, somebody said, well, there's been a lot of people got the Holy Ghost. I'll admit to that. But I just wondered, isn't there a better way to get it? Isn't there a better way to do it? Then I began to look in the Bible. And I was at a loss to find any of those ways reported in the Bible. Now see what we're after, precious people. Let's don't just hold tenaciously to the past on things. But let's try to come up to a level of what the Bible says and start standing on the Bible and God's going to be with us because we're going to meet... Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We just won't have time to turn on all those gadgets. <laughs> My brother's like a midwife. They, they, here, here come the midwife over in Egypt. Woman already had her baby, already nursing it. Here come the midwife and says, too late for you. Already had my baby. Why, brother, they're going to get the Holy Ghost like that. That's right. Hallelujah. I am too, brother. So I, I began to read in the Bible, and I saw that Philip went down on the day of Pentecost, of course. That's an unusual happening. They was all sitting there. They was waiting. See? They was waiting. They was waiting on the Lord. I tell you what they was waiting on. They was waiting for the day of Pentecost to come. That didn't mean that didn't mean they was tearing for the Holy Ghost and saying praise you, praise you, praise. That didn't mean that. They were just tearing and waiting for the day of Pentecost to come. You all see that now, don't you? See? And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, well, here come the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See? But that's a little different than what I'm going to say now. Well, in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, of course, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to the people, and people did get converted, devils cast out, and people got healed. But when the brethren of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word, they sent Peter and John down, which were apostles, to establish the church in the divine order. And here's what happened. The first time now, the first introduction, they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, that's one way, isn't it? Now, here's the other way. There's only two ways in the Bible that tells us how they receive the Holy Ghost. Peter is called down to the house of Cornelius. The place is packed full of people. All of them's hungry for the Holy Ghost. 
Brother, when you get somebody hungry to be converted, and you preach conversion, you don't have to worry about them getting converted. Now, when people's hungry for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you don't have to make no altar call. They'll get the Holy Ghost all over the house. And the Bible said, And the Holy Ghost fell on all that heard the word. The day of the circumcision that came with Peter were astonished because upon these people were poured out the like gift, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. That's the only that's the other place. Laying on of hands and that. Now just as sure as I'm standing here this afternoon, that's that's the only two ways the Bible gives. Well, I know people got the Holy Ghost other ways. I know that. But, brother, wouldn't you rather begin to, to put forth an effort to get the, it the Bible way? Because that's what you call getting it in mass production. It's coming. It's coming. Why don't we try that, man, in our churches? Like I preach in the church now, I said, if somebody's radical and they've got to have a piece of wood... I'll just turn the Bible stand over. I'll accommodate you. I'll turn the Bible stand over and say, go ahead and pray. But brother, why don't we begin to consider what the Bible says and try what the Bible says and see what God will do for us? And if He begins to work with it, it's so much easier, isn't it? And then as we begin to cultivate this, and God knows the Bible, just tell the Lord, say, this is the Bible way, and I'm trying the Bible way now. And you'll find out God will begin to work more. Brother, it's so much easier to preach to a congregation the baptism of the Holy Ghost and tell them, tell the people. We have a number of people in our church that see the Holy Ghost right out in the congregation. Yes, the last two years, people in the congregation received the Holy Ghost. You know what yourself, you'll make a god out of a piece of wood. I'm not, a, I'm, not just, I'm not against somebody having a piece of wood up there, but what are you going to do with a little tiny piece of wood when thousands of people come in? What are you going to do with that? Don't you believe they're coming in? Or are you limited in your vision? What's going to happen to all these people who's going to begin to come out of her, my people, and, and people begin to leave these uh, brothels and these terrible uh, places of amusement, and God begins to deal with hundreds of thousands, yes, and millions of people? Why, brother, our vision, if we just elevate it and begin to think what's going to happen, all we've got to do is begin to preach. You know, you, you know something else? You can begin to, like this brother preached the other night on faith. You can start preaching on faith. Faith. Belief. 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 Each individual begin to create a belief in his heart, whatever his need is. That belief will begin to operate and begin to work. God will begin to recognize that fact, begin to honor that faith. And if it's conversion, you'll get converted. If the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If it's healing, you'll get healed. And when you begin to train a congregation like that, and people like that that come in, and other people begin to tell them, Brother, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's here, everything's ready. It's here. You know that's the way the preacher makes an altar call. It's here. It's here. It's here. In the day you seek me with your whole heart, I'll be found of you. It's here. It's right here now. Brother, you'll see things operating. And if we can, we can start it off on a small scale, and they'll give you greater and greater and greater and greater. Well, so much for that. One more thing. Another very important thing is this, and those are two important things I think. Another important thing is, if you have a doctrine that's wrong, you're telling a lie. You're lying on God. And if a preacher has got a doctrine that's wrong and you accept it, and you tell it to somebody else, you're lying. Hmm? Right. First chapter of Romans said they changed the truth of God into a lie. Don't you know that truth is the opposite of error? 
A lot of people don't believe that a Holy Ghost person can lie. Brother, listen, don't you know you can misrepresent God and, and lie on God? You can lie on God. That, that's another dangerous thing. If you, don't preach the, if you don't preach the truth, and your truth is mixed with error, the error that you have is a lie. It's a lie. And brother, we, we've, got, we've got some things to do. If we are going to uh, be a partial representative of the body of Christ in these last days, we should work with all of our hearts to straighten out everything imaginable that's in the Bible that's need to be straightened out. We should glorify God with one mouth. We should see eye to eye. We should have a mental unity. Make them one even as we are one. Jesus said, the words I speak, they're not my own, but the words of him that sent me. Brother, when we get like that, or God's going to have a church that's going to judge this world and tell the truth. And the Lord's going to confirm what they preach. You don't think the Lord's going to confirm a lie, but he's going to confirm what they preach with signs following. Thank God. Those are three things. Of course, there's a lot of things we could elaborate on, but those are the three, three important things that we can do. Now, don't criticize your pastor if he, if he uh, does the opposite of what I said about these other two things, because most preachers do that. But this is just suggestive, and if it, nobody wants to do it, well, that's, uh, that's their own business. But, brother, the, the more we come to what the Bible says and strive to do it, the more su successful we're going to be in the future. Remember, we're, we're going to deal not with 20s and 30s and 50s and hundreds, and maybe a few thousand, but there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people that this body of people is going to deal with in these closing days. And you're going to have to deal with them according to the word.